Hello, my name is Dr. Charles Withers, and I will be covering carpal tunnel syndrome in this talk. The learning objectives are as follows. First, I will review the relevant anatomy, epidemiology, and classic clinical features of carpal tunnel syndrome. Second, I will outline a diagnostic approach for patients with suspected carpal tunnel syndrome. And third, I will discuss treatment options for patients with carpal tunnel syndrome. During this talk, I will define carpal tunnel syndrome, review the relevant anatomy, discuss the epidemiology, etiology, and typical clinical presentation, followed by a brief discussion of provocative tests to perform during the physical exam, diagnostic studies to consider, and a variety of treatments for patients with this disorder. So first I'll start with the definition. Carpal tunnel syndrome is the complex of symptoms that results from the compression of the median nerve as it passes through the carpal tunnel of the wrist. These symptoms typically include pain, paresthesia, and weakness in a pattern that follows the distribution of the median nerve. Although there are many nerve compression syndromes, carpal tunnel syndrome is the most common entrapment neuropathy and has gained significant notoriety due to an increased rate at which it has been recognized as an occupational hazard. Now let's briefly review the anatomy. The carpal tunnel is bound on three sides by the carpal bones of the wrists. The roof of the carpal tunnel is formed by the transverse carpal ligament, or the flexor retinaculum, which crosses superficially on the volar aspect of the wrist. Within the carpal tunnel, the median nerve is joined by nine flexor tendons and the surrounding tenosynovium. Within this anatomic construct, increased pressure on the median nerve can be exerted in two ways. First, reduction in capacity of the anatomic space through external compression, as is the case with swelling or lesions in the surrounding tissue. Or second, increase in the volume of the contents within the fixed anatomic space of the carpal tunnel, as is seen with tenosynovitis of the flexor tendons. With more and more patients and clinicians becoming aware of the signs and symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome, both the incidence and prevalence of CTS has increased in recent decades. Nearly one in five patients who presents with this constellation of hand pain, numbness, and tingling is expected to have CTS based on clinical exam and electrodiagnostic testing. Currently, the incidence is up to 276 cases per 100,000 patients annually with a prevalence of 9.2% in women and 6% in men. A review of the musculoskeletal disorders reported from European workplaces in 1998 revealed that over 60% of upper extremity complaints were the result of CTS. While there are many causes of carpal tunnel syndrome, the most common is the repetitive trauma often experienced by patients in their working environment. People that work frequently on computer keyboards, musicians, and meat cutters are among the highest at risk. Although symptoms can be bilateral or affect either hand at the time of presentation, the observation that symptoms most frequently affect the dominant hand of both left and right-handed patients is further evidence to support the idea that repetitive activity of the affected hand plays a vital role in disease pathogenesis. Connective tissue diseases are another common culprit etiology of carpal tunnel syndrome, with RA and crystal-induced arthropathies such as gout being most common. Scleroderma, PMR, polymyositis, and OA have also been implicated in patients who develop CTS. Other medical conditions that predispose patients towards developing carpal tunnel syndrome include metabolic states and illnesses like uremia, especially among patients receiving hemodialysis diabetes, hypothyroidism, and acromegaly. Infectious etiologies, including osteomyelitis of the carpal bones or septic tenosynovitis of the flexor tendons, tuberculosis, histoplasmosis, and others can cause CTS. Other miscellaneous conditions, such as amyloidosis, pregnancy, and obesity, have also been implicated in disease pathogenesis. Despite all the potential risk factors, many cases are simply categorized as idiopathic with no identifiable underlying cause. When CTS typically presents, patients note the onset of a burning pins and needles sensation in the distal distribution of the median nerve 
that occurs with flexion or extension of the hand. This is often accompanied by numbness, tingling, and decreased grip strength with symptoms that are frequently worse at night. Less frequently, patients will describe these symptoms as radiating to the ipsilateral shoulder or antecubital fossa. And some patients report symptoms that extend into the ulnar nerve distribution. The symptoms that patients experience are often reproducible with provocative maneuvers that can be performed during the physical exam. In the Phelan's maneuver, the patient's hands are placed into complete flexion for a duration of 60 seconds. A positive test causes reproduction or worsening of the patient's symptoms of median nerve entrapment. Studies have shown that sensitivity for this provocative maneuver ranges from 63 to 73% for CTS, and specificity for carpal tunnel syndrome ranges from 40 to 98%. The other most commonly performed provocative test is Tunnel sign. For this maneuver, the wrist is held in extension while the examiner provides a gentle percussion over and just proximal to the transverse ligament. Similar to Phelan's maneuver, a positive test causes reproduction or worsening of the patient's symptoms of pain or paresthesia. Generally, the sensitivity of Tunnel sign is thought to be less than that of Phelan's maneuver with reported values reflecting this in a range of 48 to 73 percent. The specificity of Tunnell's sign also has a broad range, with reported values spanning from 30 to 94 percent. The diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome is clinical, established on the basis of the patient's history and physical exam. In addition to asking about a classic distribution of symptoms and performing provocative maneuvers, the examining clinician should also look for evidence of thenar muscle atrophy, which is often a sign of late or advanced disease. Additionally, imaging studies can be helpful in supporting the clinical diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome. Conventional x-rays are modestly useful but are rarely used. However, ultrasound has gained popularity as a diagnostic tool. Typically, swelling of the median nerve can be seen with evidence of flattening of the nerve observed distally. The most sensitive imaging study, though, is MRI, which is capable of accurately delineating thickening of the flexor tendons and their sheaths as they course through the carpal tunnel space, occupying lesions compressing the median nerve. Perhaps the most important diagnostic study is the measurement of sensory nerve conduction velocity. Decreased conduction velocity, along with a prolonged distal motor latency, supports the presence of median nerve compression. When managing carpal tunnel syndrome, thought should be given to identifying and treating the underlying cause. For instance, if the patient has gout or rheumatoid arthritis, treating the underlying illness may subsequently improve the patient's symptoms of median nerve entrapment. For newly diagnosed and mild disease, conservative management should be initiated. Splinting is an easy, cost-effective intervention, which, if successful, aids in confirming the diagnosis of CTS. The splint should keep the wrist in a neutral position, and patients should be encouraged to wear this device at night to prevent the hand from moving into a flex position during sleep. NSAIDs are generally limited in cases of CTS where an inflammatory etiology for CTS has been identified. The injection of steroids locally, however, has been a very effective means of treating CTS. Local corticosteroid injection has the highest efficacy when used on patients with early disease. The best candidates for this therapy have less than one year of symptoms and have lack of evidence of significant thenar atrophy or decreased grip strength. When injecting, the needle is inserted superficially just proximal to the wrist crease and advanced under the flexor retinaculum. The palmaris longus tendon should be used as a landmark with the needle being inserted on the ulnar side of this tendon. When patients have failed conservative therapy due to progression or refractory disease, surgical management should be considered. The most common procedure is a carpal tunnel release performed by incising the transverse carpal ligament, decompressing the carpal tunnel. This procedure is considered definitive treatment for carpal tunnel syndrome. In conclusion, the key points of this lecture include the following. Carpal tunnel syndrome 
is the complex of pain and paresthesia resulting from direct or indirect compression of the median nerve as it passes through the carpal tunnel of the wrist. CTS has many potential causes, including overuse in the workplace, connective tissue disease, endocrine and infectious etiologies. CTS is diagnosed clinically with a careful history with symptoms that are usually present in a median nerve distribution and provocative maneuvers on physical exam. The diagnosis is often confirmed with ultrasound, MRI, and or nerve conduction studies. And finally, treatment should be approached with attempts at conservative management with splinting and local steroids with definitive surgical management reserved for progressive or refractory disease. Thank you for your time and attention, and I hope that you have enjoyed this lecture on CTS.